How many of you are happy to be in the house of God this afternoon? Amen. Amen. It's such a joy to be back and uh, it's lovely to see and, uh, and uh, see some, some known faces. And it's so nice to, to see you guys all smile. And um, I bring greetings from the churches back in, uh, in Dubai and in Abu Dhabi. It's an amazing journey, uh, the last uh, two, two and a half years. Uh, and, and God has been faithful. God has been faithful. And uh, we request you to continue to pray, pray for the churches there. Uh, New Life AG Church has always been a sending church. So continue to pray for the ones who are sent from here and continue to rise up to be readily available to be sent into the mission fields. God bless you. God bless you. So let's go into the word this morning. And I want you to take your uh, Bibles out and, and go into the gospel according to Mark. Let's go to the gospel according to Mark. And I want to begin by asking you this question. How many of you have gone through some tough times in the recent past? Can I see your hands, please? Right? So we all have gone through some, some tough times. We've all gone through life's ups and downs. I was just reading about uh, what's happening in Turkey. I mean, there's, there's, some, there's some heavy flooding there. And in a month back, they had a terrible, massive earthquake, and now it's flooding. Look at what they're going through as a nation. And we here, there's so many of you, who, you lift up, lifted your hands up saying that you went through a, a tough situation in the recent past. So as a disciple of Jesus Christ, this morning, I'm here to encourage all of you saying that there is hope in Jesus alone. Hallelujah. Can I hear a louder hallelujah? hallelujah. Amen. Does Jesus know your situation? Absolutely yes. And there is hope in Christ. Reading the gospel according to Mark, if you read, one thing that we can, we can understand is Mark is trying to write to a group of persecuted Christians. It was not an easy life for these guys who ac accepted Christ. Mark is writing to a group of persecuted Christians and, and if you have to give a theme or if you have to give a title to, to what Mark writes, he writes about a suffering Messiah, a servant Messiah. Can we say this together? A suffering Messiah, a servant Messiah. He's not talking about a happy Jesus and, a, and, a, and an authoritative Jesus. He's talking about this Jesus who's the Messiah came into this world and he was a suffering Messiah. He was a servant Messiah. Matthew actually, uh, Mark actually uh, makes it three segments. If you, if you read the entire gospel, according to Mark, it's into three segments. And today we are going to be focusing on Mark's gospel from chapter 8, 22 to chapter 10. That's where we are going to be positioning ourselves and we are going to be, we are going to be talking about uh, a lot of stuff from here. So, so one thing that we can notice in the writing that Mark is writing is, he talks about the suffering Messiah, the servant Messiah was always on the move. Can we say this together? Always on the move. He was always on the move. This Messiah had a mission. This Jesus was clearly purpose driven and he was not sloppy in what he was doing. He was always moving from one town to another town. He was moving from one village to another village. He was always on the move. And how can we understand this? Mark gives us some clues. So this afternoon, my, my objective is to help us all understand that this Jesus that we have given our life to, this Jesus who we have made our Lord and Savior is, 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 is a suffering Messiah, is a, is a servant Messiah, and he was clearly purpose-driven, moving from city to city, town to town. And in this process, what is expected out of you and me? What does the suffering Messiah expect from me? What is the suffering Messiah is expecting from us as a church? That's my objective here. So, so, so to begin this journey, let's try to understand how beautifully Mark gives us some clues to understand that this Jesus was always on the move. Can we, can we start with Mark chapter 8 verse 27? Mark chapter 8 verse 27, if you read, here it says, Jesus and his disciples went to, to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. And what happens? On the, on the way he asked them, who do people say 
I am. Can we all lift up our voices and, and, and read some scriptures this morning? It's, it's good to read the word of God in the house of God. Are you with me, church? Amen. So I want you to, to help me. I want you to, to read out loud the scriptures that's, that's going to be coming up on the screen. Let's read another clue that Mark leaves behind for us to understand that, that Jesus was on the move. Let's read Mark chapter 9, verse 33. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? The earlier clue was, they were on the way. He asked them on the way. The second clue is, he's talking about, what were you guys talking about while we were on the road? Are you able to understand? Another clue, let's read another one. Mark chapter 10, verse 32. They were, where? They were on their way to Jerusalem. So here again, we see that Jesus was, was on the way and Mark is giving us clues that he was not based in one place. He was clearly moving. And the last clue that we can pick up from Mark chapter 10, verse 52. What does it say there? And followed Jesus along the road. Along the road. These phrases focused on Jesus was clearly on the way. He was always on the mission. He was always traveling. He was a traveling evangelist. And Mark is writing to a persecuted group of Christians, encouraging them to stay on to the, to the, to the convictions and to the, to the teachings. And he's portraying Jesus. This Jesus was moving from one place to the other. In fact, in some translations, if you read, the gospel according to Mark alone records the word immediately. The word immediately. Some of us pronounce it as immediately. Some of us say it as immediately. However you want to call it or you want to pronounce. The word immediately is, is mentioned close to 41 times in the gospel according to Mark. 41 times. Why? There is a reason. Turn to the neighbor seated next to you and tell them immediately. Immediately. Have you had, have you had, uh, have you had worked with, with bosses, sometimes some bosses, they will write an email to you and before that email lands into your desk, they will be right there in your cubicle and they will say, hey, I've sent you an email. Can you just check and act on it ASAP? Have you, have you had uh, people who have done that to you? I had a boss. He used to write an email and before the email could come, he'll be next to me, say, hey, um, we need to get this, this done soon. Can you, can you act on it? Act on it as of yesterday. That, that, that's something similar with Jesus. He was, he was quick. He was immediate. He was always on the road. He was moving from one town to another town because he was clearly hearing the voice of the Father and he was led by the Spirit and he was quick to fulfill the mission that was given to him. So as disciples of Jesus Christ gathered here, New Life AG Church, 11 a.m. service, we need to understand that as a disciple of Christ, we need to be quick. We need to be quick. Why do I say that? Let's, let's hear, because what is the central message that Jesus went around preaching in every city, every town? What was he saying? Any, any responses from, from, the, from the audience here? Anybody wants to say, what was Jesus' central message? Kingdom of God is near. This is what Jesus was going around saying, hey, the kingdom of God is near. In some translations it says, the kingdom of God is at hand. Which means what? Quick. The kingdom of God is at hand. Quick. Because the Lord is tarrying, we, we think it's going to take longer time. We never know how quick the Lord is going to come. So the message today for New Life AG Church, 11 a.m. services, the kingdom of God is at hand and you and I as disciples of Jesus Christ, we need to respond to this call. We need to be quick to this call. We need to understand this call. To understand this call, let's start this, this journey this, this morning from a very unique story that's, that's mentioned only in the gospel according to Mark. There are two things or two uniqueness about this story. One, it's only mentioned in this particular uh, gospel account, which is in Mark chapter 8, 22 to 26. Let's read. 
they came to Bethsaida and some people brought who? Come on, some people brought who? A blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, Do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They looked like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened. His sight was restored and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home saying, don't even go into the village. So the first uniqueness of this story is it's found only in the gospel according to Mark. And the second uniqueness, any guesses what is the second uniqueness of this story? The miracle taking place in stages. Are you with me, church? The miracle is now taking place, not instantly. But Jesus has, has performed miracles like that. There are times where he said a word and somebody was healed. There was a time where he touched and somebody was healed. There is a mentioning where there's this lady who came and touched the hem of Jesus' garment and she was instantly cured. But why this miracle is taking place in stages? That's the uniqueness of this story. So how do we understand? Why do we, how, where do we get the answer? Why the miracle takes place in stages? We read from Mark 8, 22. To understand this, we need to read from Mark chapter 8, verse 17 onwards. Remember this. When Mark was writing, he never wrote with chapter and verses. Today we are reading with chapter and verses. When Mark wrote, he never wrote chapter 8, verse 22. He never did that. In fact, if you have to meet any of these writers, if you meet John or if you meet, uh, uh, okay, if you, if you happen to meet John in heaven and you ask him, John, what is John 3.16? He might say, I do not know. Because he didn't write John 3.16. He just wrote what the Spirit inspired him. So for us to understand, we need to go back to Mark according to Mark chapter 8 and verse, verse 17 onwards, if you read, you'll be able to understand why this miracle is taking in stages. Mark chapter 8, 17 to 21. Let's read this. Are you with me, church? Can we all read it together? Yeah, can I see your hands if you're with me? Okay, can I hear a hallelujah if you're with me? Amen. Amen. So let's read Mark chapter 8, verse 17 to 21. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered, seven. He said to them, do you still not understand? Do you still not understand? I'm sure all of you in this room would have experienced the hand of God in your life, right? This morning we are here, seated in this room, is because of the hand of God. Today we are able to get out of our bed with life, with breath in our nostrils, is because of the hand of God. There are many who went to sleep last night and couldn't get up. And today we are here is because of the hand of God. So Jesus here throws eight questions at the disciples. And the last one he says, do you still not understand? And then when you read from verse 22 onwards, Mark records that uniqueness of that particular miracle that takes place in, in, in stages. And this is for us to understand that the disciples of Jesus themselves were partially blind. That's why I've titled this morning's sermon as, Do You See? Ask the person seated next to you and ask them, Do you see? Do you see? Are you seeing like the blind man stages? You see people like trees? Or are you able to see what Jesus wants you to see? That's why I've titled this morning's sermon as, Do You See? Do You See? Because Jesus, Jesus' disciples, sometimes they didn't get it. The next, the next narrative further explains, if you read Mark 8, 
27 to 33 verses. Let's read. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, Who do people say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, Do you say, Who do you say I am? Peter answered, You are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell about him. So here, we, we see that Mark, in his writings, he arranges two blind men receiving sight as bookends, two miracles. Have you seen a bookend? These days, it's difficult to see books because everything has become digital. But when you go to homes or when you go to a library, there are bookends. And the, and the purpose of the bookend is what? To make sure the books don't fall off. It's intact. So there's one end at this side and there's another end and in between there are books. So likewise, in, in the gospel according to Mark from 8 to 10, chapters 8 to 10, there are two blind men miracles are mentioned. One is a blind man receiving the miracle in stages and one is the blind Bartimaeus in, in chapter 10. And two blind men miracles act as bookends for us to understand what is the core of Mark's intent between chapter 8 and 10. And are you ready to start the journey with me? Hallelujah. So let's start off with this first one. Let's read uh, Mark chapter 8, verse 31 to 33. Mark chapter 8, verse 31 to 33. He then began to teach them. Who is now teaching? Jesus is teaching them. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Jesus is plainly teaching. Jesus is plainly teaching. And I want you to, to understand this. I want to do a little enactment here for me to pass on the message. So I'm going to, I'm going to call. Can I, can I disturb Danny? Danny, can you just come here for a minute, Danny? Thank you. It's been a while since we did all this in church. Yeah, so let's, let's, let's try to, try to pictureize. Jesus is plainly teaching. That's what Mark is is writing, right? Are we, can we get back to the text, text here? So Jesus is, is plainly teaching. Let's say this is Jesus. He's teaching. And what did he teach? What does your text say? What did he teach? That the Son of Man must be? He has to go through the, the persecution. He has to go through. He has to endure the cross. He needs to go through the persecution. He will be rejected. He plainly teaches. That's what Mark is writing to us. But what was Peter's response? What did Peter do? Can we read? And Peter took him aside and rebuked him. Try to, let's picture this. So let me, let, let's, let's say I'm Peter. Danny is Jesus. So Danny is finished preaching. So now Peter is taking Jesus aside. Hey, Jesus, what are you talking? What nonsense is this? I thought you were going to come and dethrone Rome and all that. Now you're talking about you getting killed. Just shut up. Because the text says, Peter rebukes Jesus. Is it there in your text? Are you with me, church? Yes. And now let's now read what was Jesus' response. Let's go back to the text and let's read what is Jesus' response. When, but when Jesus, what did he do? Turned back and... So Jesus, now I'll play the role of Jesus. Now this is Peter here. So the rebuking has happened. Peter has already rebuked Jesus. But Jesus, now when this conversation happening, he's turning back, looking at who? Because Jesus knew Peter is just the representation of the class. Everybody has got the same attitude. But Peter had the guts to come forward and do this to Jesus. So but Jesus turned back to the rest of the eleven, and then he tells them, you guys are so mindful of human concerns. Let's read the text. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human 
concerns. Thank you, Danny, for this. So are you able to get the picture? Jesus is talking, plainly explaining what he has to endure to fulfill the plan of the Father. But the disciples did not get. And Jesus says, hey, you guys are only bothered about your concern, not the concern of God. So Jesus clarifies. How does he clarify? Mark 8, 34. Just immediate verse, Mark 8, 34. Then he called the crowd. Can we all read it together? Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. How many of you can boldly lift up your hand and say, I'm a disciple of Christ? So the call for a disciple is not an easy call. You are called to deny ourselves. We are called to take up the cross. We are called to follow him. When you are when you're, when you're preaching from this verse in a congregation like this, the immediate response is spouses, they, they look at each other. Because they, they know that that's the cross sometimes God has given them to carry. On a lighter note. So Jesus, first time when he talks about his, 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 his suffering, the disciples did not see. The disciples did not see. Then let's read another time. The second time Jesus talks about his suffering. The second time Jesus talks about his suffering. Let's read Mark chapter 9, verse 30, 31 and 32. Can we all read this? 30 to 32, Mark chapter 9. They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, the son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about. So the first time they reacted, they sent one class monitor. Peter, Peter, you go. What is this guy talking about? Then Jesus gave them a fitting response. Then after some time, when they move to another place, when Jesus talks about, hey, I'll be killed, man. I'll be rejected. I'll be killed. Three days, I will rise up. Now, their response is, they were, shh. Why? Because they were afraid to ask him about. They were afraid to ask him about. But Jesus is Jesus. Let's see what was Jesus' response. Just from the next verse onwards, 9.33 to 37. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them. Who's asking? Jesus is asking. He asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? Because they didn't ask, no. They were afraid. But Jesus is Jesus. He found there's something happening. So he's asking, what did you argue while we were on the road? But they kept okay, quiet. Because on the way, they argued about... Can we say that together? They were argued about... Who was the greatest? See, Jesus is talking about something else. But the problem for the disciples or the concerns for the disciples were, who are the greatest? So that's why when I started the sermon, I said, how many of you have endured tough situations in life? And we, most of us lift up their hands. Don't worry and don't think that Jesus is ignoring your concern. Don't think that Jesus has forgotten you of what you are going through. He knows it very well. Because what does the word say? He knows us by our name. He is so mindful of us. To a level where the word of God says that he knows the number of hair in our head. He has carved our name in the palm of his hands. These are all, these are all these verses and these, these portions of scripture further affirm to us that this God that we worship, this Jesus that we worship is so mindful of us. So never doubt Jesus. Never doubt Jesus. But my objective today is we need to see what Jesus wants us to see. So ask the person next to you once again, do you see? Do you see? Do you see? So they were worried about who will be the greatest. Coming to Mark chapter 9.33. To 37, they were worried about who will be the greatest. Then Jesus says, sitting down, Jesus called the 12 and said, what is he saying? Can we all read together? Anyone who wants to be the first must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child whom he placed among them. 
Taking the child in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. So what was Jesus' clarification here when they were talking about who's the greatest? He's saying, if you are a disciple, if you want to be my disciple, you need to be servants of? What is the word there? All. He's not saying you need to be a servant of fellow disciples. He's not saying you need to be a servant of Christians alone. But he's saying, if you have to be my disciple, you need to see what I am seeing, and I want you to be servants of all. While we endure our problems, while we go through our own challenges and hurdles in life, there is a call for a disciple, and the Spirit of God is telling New Life AG Church, do you see what Christ wants us to see? And Jesus clarifies. It's like, in, 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 but, but, but the disciples were again blinded. Third time Jesus talks about his persecution that is coming his way. Let's read Mark 10, 32 to 34. We are coming in an order, 8, 9, and 10. Mark 10, 32 to 34. Let's read. They were on their way to, up to Jerusalem. Now they are coming to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the climax. Jerusalem where everything is going to happen. Everything is going to unfold. The cross is going to take place. The arrest is going to happen. The persecution is going to take place. The cross is going to take place. The crucifixion is going to take place. The death is going to take place. The resurrection is going to take, take place. Everything is going to take place in Jerusalem. So it's a climax. So they were on their way to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way. And the disciples were astonished while those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the twelve aside. Third time in the three chapters. Mark is writing to us, persecuted Christians. Third time, he's taking the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. But the disciples were blinded and they did not see what Jesus wanted them to see. How can we say this? Mark 10, 35 to 37 explains. What does it say? Then James and John. Can we all read it together? Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other to your left in your glory. The disciples were only concerned about themselves. He's talking about fulfilling the plan of the Father. But the disciples were talking about who will sit on the left, on the right. The disciples were talking about who will be the greatest. The disciples were concerned about the concerns of man, but they were not concerned about the concerns of God. So as disciples in the 21st century, modern day India, Chennai context, we cannot be partially blind like the disciples of Jesus Christ. Are you with me, church? The call for us is to see what Jesus wants us to see. So Jesus clarifies again for the third time. He clarifies. And let's read that. Mark 10, 38 to 45. Let's read. You don't know what you are asking. Are, are we there? Can we all read it together? You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said... You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become or whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave to all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for 
many. So three times Jesus talks about the persecution that he needs to endure. And all three times the disciples did not see what Jesus wanted them to see. I call them, or I can, we can give them a term to, to, the, to, the, to the state in, in which the disciples were, and we can give them a title called, they were self-absorbed. Can we say this together? Self-absorbed. The disciples were self-absorbed. While Jesus is telling them, you need to be a servant to all. While Jesus is saying that you need to deny yourself, while Jesus was saying you need to be the last and not the first, they were more self-absorbed to find out where can I sit, to your left or to your right? Where can I be? How, what kind of glory that I can enjoy? They were self-absorbed. Sometimes, church, we need, to, we need to shamelessly sometimes accept the fact that we too are self-absorbed. Are you with me, church? We too are self-absorbed. Do you, do you realize, do we realize that this death that Jesus endured, do you think we are, we, are, we are worthy of it? While we were yet sinners, he chose to die for our sins. And we serve a God who wants us to see what he is seeing. But we sometimes are only self-absorbed. We sometimes are only self-absorbed. What do we mean by self-absorbed? How can I relate to that in this, in this context, in today's, today's context? In today's context, we can say we are self-absorbed by worrying, am I recognized? We are self-absorbed by worrying, why that person spoke to me like this? We are self-absorbed by, by thinking, will I be given prominence wherever I am? We are so self-absorbed. But the disciples of Jesus have a call to serve. Did Jesus demonstrate serving? Absolutely, yes. But the disciples of Jesus doesn't want to be serving. Why, why they were in this state? Because we need to understand when these disciples of Jesus, who Jesus just handpicked them, they were brought up from their childhood, explaining to them, teaching them that there's going to be a Messiah who's going to come, which they understood. But it was also taught that this Messiah is going to dethrone Rome. So when Jesus was talking about getting killed and, and going through persecution, they were unable to accept the fact. They thought, okay, the Messiah has come. So they were, they got that picture. But they did not get the message of the Messiah or the mission of the Messiah. So they were partially blind. Are you with me, church? So the call for a disciple, I want to close with this five takeaways. Quickly, I want to close in the next five, five to eight minutes. I want to close. But I'm here to help you understand a call for a disciple is much more than what you and I are processing. Jesus knows us. He knows what you are going through. And he says, I am with you. Your thoughts, he knows it. Your problem, he has a solution. He has not left us alone, nor forsaken us. He has told us, hey, come to me. I will give you what? Rest. He said, cast all your cares upon me, for I care for you. So this Jesus has not forgotten us, but this morning, the Spirit of God is saying, disciples of Jesus at New Life AG Church, would you rise up to see what Jesus wants us to see and understand the call of a disciple? And to begin with, the call of a disciple is this, Mark chapter 8, 34. Once again, let's read Mark 8, 34. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, can we all read it together? Whoever wants to be my disciple, must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. So I just did a simple Google search on the definition of disciples. What does disciple mean? A disciple is what? He's a follower. Can we say it? A follower. A disciple means he's a follower. He's an adherent. He faithfully adheres to the master's teaching. So a disciple is a follower, he's an adherent, he's a pupil, he's an apprentice. So we need to ask ourselves, we call ourselves disciples. 
am I following Jesus by following his teachings? Or for me, following Jesus is a Sunday morning 11 a.m. service. I'm just, I'm just wanting you to think, think, think for yourself. Are you following? Are we following what Jesus taught us? Am I a pupil? Am I a student? In the world, we are always a student. You want to constantly upgrade your skills. You want to constantly learn what's the new software. You want to constantly learn a language because you want to travel abroad. You want to relocate to a new country. You are always learning according to the world and we, we, are, we, are, we are mentally prepared for that. But to walk and to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, we hardly take time to be a student and learn from his word. Are you with me, church? So the call for a disciple is to be a student, to be a learner, to be an adherent, to be an apprentice. So what is the call? The first call is, are we willing to deny ourselves? Are we willing to deny self and accept Jesus? It's about having Jesus in the center. Sometimes we have heard people say this, I like Jesus, but I don't like the church. How can we separate the two? Because Jesus died for his church. That's what the Bible says. So when we love the church, when we love, when we love the Lord, we need to love his church. We need to love his church. So we need to deny ourselves and we need to love what the Lord does. We need to prioritize Christ in the center of our lives. Can we say this word center? We need, to, we need to have Jesus in the center, not as, not as 11 a.m. ritual on a Sunday. No, that's not, the, that's not what Jesus wants us to. He wants us to have him in the center on Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, on Thursday, on Friday, on Saturday, Sunday, and all times of the day, he needs to be in the center of our lives. He needs to be in the center of our lives. The second takeaway for a, for a disciple is we need to follow the teachings of Christ. Who is a disciple of Jesus? Who is a Christian? Is, Christian is not a Christian because he's got a Christian name. A Christian is a Christian because he follows the teachings of Christ. So if I have to be a disciple, I need to, I need to be a servant of all. Can I leave my crown down? Can I leave my titles down? Can I leave my designations down? Can I leave my positions down and be willing to be a servant? to be willing to be a servant of all. Because the Son of Man, Jesus himself came for what? To serve and not to be served. Not to be served. Sometimes we, we interchange when we, when we speak about somebody. He is a, they, we, we sometimes say he is a, he's a great man of God. Or we say he is a, is a is a is a is a great servant of a humble god no it's about we need to be a humble servant of a great god are you with me we 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 have everything it's just that we need to realign our priorities and start becoming a disciple the third takeaway for us as a disciple or the third call for us as a disciple is we have to bear fruit can we say bearing fruit we need to bear fruit John beautifully writes, John chapter 15, verse 5 to 8, I am the wine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is for my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So in order for us to show off as disciples of Jesus, we should bear fruit. In order for us to bear fruit, we should be connected to the wine. In order for us to be connected to the wine, we should live our life according to the teachings of Christ. Hallelujah. 
Are you still with me? Yeah? At the back, I, can I hear a hallelujah from the back? Hallelujah! Yes, they are still with us. Are you understanding the call of a disciple? Because the disciples who lived and walked with Christ, they themselves did not see what Jesus saw till the time the Spirit was poured out on them. But when, when we read after the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit was poured out on them, these unschooled, uneducated, could not understand disciples with the power of the Holy Spirit, they went around the world preaching and teaching and turned the world upside down for Christ. Hallelujah. Today we are here as disciples is because somebody from the 12, filled with the Holy Spirit, came to this side of the world. Are you with me, church? So you and I are filled with the Holy Spirit. You and I have the word of God in our hand. And we need to start seeing what Jesus wants us to see and be a disciple of Christ and take up the cross and follow him. The fourth takeaway for us is as a disciple, a call for a disciple of Jesus, we need to understand church. It's a sermon by itself, which, which, we, can, which we can preach for hours together, but we need to understand church. Because Jesus died for the church. How many of you can say yes to that? Right? So we need to understand church. Church is not like this. It's one of the elements of the church, one of the aspects of the church. Church is about family. Church is about community. When you read what Paul writes to Titus in Titus chapter 2, verse 1 to 15. I want you to make note of it and go back and read Titus chapter 2, verse 1 to 15. Paul clearly says, hey, Titus, you are there to set in order what remains in disorder. I want you to help people, individuals and families understand what it is to be in a church. Titus 2, 1 to 15. Go read simple English. We cannot be however we want to be in the house of the Lord. Paul writes to Titus and says, this is how individuals should order themselves. This is what families should order themselves. And then Paul goes on to write in, to, to the church at Colossae, to the church at Ephesus. And then Peter writes in 1 Peter 3, 1 to 7. These are called household texts. They are, they are written to individual families. They are also written to, to, to the community. So do we understand, as a disciple of Jesus, do we understand this call to be connected to a community? Think about it. Think about it. The fifth and the final is, as a disciple of Jesus, any disciple for that matter, we are called to fulfill the mission of the master. For people, in, people working in, in, in the corporate set, sector, you need to know the vision and the mission of your company, right? And we need to flow with the mission and the vision of the company, right? We cannot have our own separate vision and mission when the company has a different vision and the mission. So as disciples of Jesus Christ, while we battle our own life issues, while we battle our crises, while we go through the challenges of life, Jesus is with us. No doubt about it. He has plans to prosper us. No doubt about it. But are we fulfilling our call as a disciple by fulfilling his mission. Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. Just two verses and we'll close with this. So Christ himself, who's giving? So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and the teachers to equip the people at NLAG 11 o'clock service for the works of service. Why? So that the body of Christ may be built. Able to get the idea, the mission? So in order for us to fulfill the mission, Jesus did not give us the mission and leave us. He has given us the evangelists. He has given us the prophets. He has given us the pastors. He has given us the teachers. So that these guys will help all of us to be equipped for the works of service in the world and save the lost, build the body of Christ, which is his church. But sometimes, like the disciples just that Mark portrayed, 
we are self absorbed with our own problems today you ask yourself 24 hours how much time you spend in battling your own family situation how much time we spend in in battling relationships if only we can come to an agreement saying that hey this is the order in which our family should function can we can we agree to that if we quickly agree to that more hours in your life will be made available to do the works of service sometimes we are selfish we need to accept the fact we are selfish we want to handle and spend all our time handling our problems and in that pro- in that in that in that in the thing what happens we miss out on god's mission we miss out on god's mission whenever that day happens if we die and go or when he comes and when he asks us when he asks us an account of our time he will ask us this question so did you fulfill the mission you came to the services on sunday mornings you had the word of god in your hand you were filled with the holy spirit but did you fulfill my mission so we need to come to a conclusion that i am called to be a disciple of jesus to fulfill his mission and how can i do that all i have to do is live a life according to his teachings build my home according to his teachings be involved or engaged in good occupations take care of the poor and the needy around us in the community and share the good news and fulfill the mission of christ are you with me church would you all close your eyes and as you are seated as you are seated as you are seated ask yourselves do we see what jesus want us to see ask yourselves am i partially blind when i say partially blind we understood the messiah but we did not understand the the message of the messiah ask yourselves let us have a clear vision of what it is to be a disciple of christ what it is what it is to be a follower of this jesus he give, he wants to he is given his life and he will continue to lead us he will continue to help us he will continue to protect us he will continue to meet our needs he will continue to meet all our hearts desires he will continue to lift our burdens he will continue to wipe our cry he will continue to be the god of our lives but are we willing to be his disciples or are we partially blind about this